Hi, I'm Amy Sullivan, I'm the chair of the AAAR Endowment Committee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 15th in our monthly series of AST lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. So each month, a high impact paper is selected by the editors of AST to be presented by its authors. With these lectures, we hope to be able to highlight the amazing research happening in our community, to tie our journal to other activities, and also to give us the opportunity to all come together outside of the annual conference. These lectures are being recorded and will be later posted to AAAR's new YouTube channel, which you can access from the AAAR website under the events tab. In addition, each month, one of our student chapters is serving as host. And so I want to thank everyone who's helped to make these possible and also for all of you for joining us. And so now I'll turn it over to our student chapter from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champlain. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this month's AST lecture series, Reducing COVID-19 Airborne Transmission Risks on Public Transportation Buses, an empirical study on aerosol dispersion and control. My name is Tessa Clarizio, and I'm a graduate student and president of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign student chapter of the American Association for Aerosol Research. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that our chapter, along with the University of Florida student chapter will be hosting a virtual research symposium next month on September 8th, and we are currently accepting abstracts for this. Registration is free, and you can find more details on our website, um, AAA, or it's aaaruic.wixsite.com slash home. I'll be sending the link in the chat shortly. We have two speakers today, Nathan Edwards and Richard Potemper. Nathan Edwards is the principal investigator who led MITRE research initiatives on COVID-19 aerosol risk. He recently served as the moderator and panel chair for the National Academies of Science TCRP Insight event, Air Quality and Transit Buses. Mr. Edwards has 15 years experience in technology science and engineering and several patents and publications in electronics technology for sensing and detection. A previous career field of nine years in emergency and fire services, Mr. Edwards holds a master's in electrical and computer engineering from UIUC, AS in fire science, and formerly licensed as mobile intensive care parad paramedic. Richard Potember is the co-principal investigator for the MITRE research initiatives on COVID-19 aerosol risk. Dr. Potember is a chemist who has more than 25 years in applied science of biochem risk, materials research, and detection technologies. His career work includes a number of patents and publications and has worked in academia and federal government, both as a researcher and program manager. Dr. Potember holds a PhD in chemistry. Let's welcome our speakers today. Well, thank you, Tessa. Um, just for our audience, I, I'm unsure if Richard's gonna be able to join today. Um, so. Oh, you are. Oh, good. Thank you, Richard. Should I didn't I see you online. All right. Should I switch out? Try to get a camera. I don't know. Uh, I either way, well, your voice would be uh, appreciated. Okay. Okay. I'm here. Thank you. So we're gonna tell a story. Um, now you can read our paper that was published in the AST uh, Journal, but we want to share insights of of actually conducting field studies, um, and and kind of the um, process that we went through. Um, there's a lot of complexities when you go out into the uh, in the wild, crazy real world of, of doing empirical studies. So this is not laboratory based, um, where you have highly controlled environments. Um, but that's okay. You know the the question at hand was really how do we reduce risk of of aerosols uh, during the pandemic? And and the real world is very very different, or can be very different from uh, simulation environments. So we're going to share a story, and hopefully you enjoy it. Um, and then uh, certainly at the end, we'll, we'll take some questions. All right, so let's start here. Um, our, our two uh, series of field experiments uh, on both uh, school buses and transit buses, you know, in total about 84 test runs over a two weeks span, lots of data uh, and a lot of miles on the road. All these tests um, that we published in the, um, in the paper were bus in motion. So these were not static. Again, realistic environments is what we're aiming for. But uh, again, as I want to mention, we're going to back up a little bit. Well, how did we get started? So let me share that uh, with you. 
Now, just for setting the basis, I, I like this paper. They had a nice uh, infographic on it. Um, uh, and again, the reference, you know, 2019, um, you know, describes airborne transmission. So we have these large droplets um, that tend to follow the floor pretty quickly and they don't stay aloft, but the aerosols tend to stay aloft. Now there's debate in the scientific community, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, what, what size is an aerosol? Some say uh, five microns or less, some say hundred microns or less. Um, I, either way, what we're really after trying to understand is, is the aerosols that stay in the air, what, regardless of the size. Um, and, and really the reduction is how do we disrupt this chain of transmission from the uh, source all the way through the inhalation hazards. So, you know, when we conduct studies, we, we kind of looked at um, transportation sector as a whole and, and try to understand what was going on in prior research. And, and the reality is there's been a lot of uh, other research on spread of infection, not so much the airflow part. Uh, of course, this is where this, the society comes to play. Um, there's been a lot of research on theoretical models or simulation, fluid dynamic models and so forth. Um, and a lot of uh, best practices came out during the pandemic. But the, the challenge is, and, and this is where Richard and I and our team couldn't really find, is that what was the scientific basis on all these best practices? Do they really work? And that's really the fundamental question. Even today, you know, with the BA5 Omicron variant, you know, with the transmissibility being much, much higher, we still have to understand what's going on with the aerosols. So ultimately, in the end, only a few have conducted field studies, uh, some in laboratory environments, which is great, uh, but not so much in transportation sector. So that's kind of what we were after. So let's back up. Um, we, we conducted the bus studies from July through September of 2020, um, but that's not where we started. So, you know, as we're all, probably all of us were watching in, in early 2020 as the, um, as the pandemic started emerging with, with the COVID, and we started watching that uh, take presence in the United States at a few locations. Um, you know, Richard and I had a number of lunchtime discussions um, about this, like, well, geez, what can we do? You know, both of us have backgrounds in bio threat. Um, you know, myself as a, as a healthcare practitioner, emergency responder, and Richard works on these problems before with anthrax and post 9-11. Like, we, we got to do something. We have enough knowledge and un understanding, but what is it? So we actually started with this uh, looking at masks, not so much about the personal protective equipment, um, on, on the inhalation and filtration, but really about the dispersion control. I think at the time, many, many others were jumping on board trying to understand what kinds of materials can be used to filter out um, uh, particles. And you know, knowing that the uh, N95 melt um, blown polypropylene was now being under uh, a supply chain issue, um, predominantly locked down because China was the number one producer of that anymore. Um, and US production had ramped down. So we want to look at the dispersion control, not so much the other fabrics. Um, and so we started with, um, I think day number one, which was April 3rd, um, our, this is through an IRAD internal research and development funding here at MITRE. They said, go, go as fast as you can. And, and so the first day um, I, I'd spent at Walmart trying to shop for all kinds of fabrics materials, went to Harbor Freight Tools, anything I'd get my hands on because the supply chains had already started shutting down. In fact, Walmart on that weekend, actually all fabric stores, there had been a run on the fabrics. So you couldn't find different fabrics to test. So we, we scrounged and got as much as we could. We had already shut down the office environments. So uh, the picture over on the right side is, is out of my garage, just trying to lay out the supplies and trying to figure out what are we gonna to do to build test apparatus and to test this. Um, we're fortunate that uh, the American Red Cross uh, here in Southeastern Colorado um, had a few old CPR mannequins. And that would be great because they have um, a lung uh, that's great for, for physical stimulation as well as the form of the face. And so we we modified that to add a, a medical spirometer which actually measures the airflow and we can match um, with the compressed air in the expansion chamber, match that, that exhalation to a human cough and um, also a sneeze or just simple breathing, a sing single exhalation. The other thing that was useful is our local uh, county public health had given us a couple of these bag valve masks. 
Again, we weren't sure the amount of uh, apparatus we needed to estimate the dispersion. So we just got our hands on, on all this stuff. And you know, with the fabrics, we, we picked out a handful of uh, patterns and sewed those. Um, we had 40 different masks and fabrics. And we published this so you can read the paper. Um, and, you know, we tried a couple of things that we thought might work. Um, and, the, and the real question that we we're after is, how do we capture the data, the quantitative data of dispersion without having um, a lab set up to do so? You know, here at MITRE, it, historically, this has not been one of our science and engineering areas. So we're rapidly trying to stand up this, this test, um, as well as understanding what's in the fabric. So um, Richard, I don't know if you want to describe your, just quickly, your partnership that you struck up with Spirotech and, and how that conversation went. Yeah, we were trying to decide what we were going to aerosolize. And uh, uh, one of the early thoughts was to look at fluorescent particles. We could get fluorescent particles the size of what we thought the virus would be and aerosolize them. And then and then uh, putting them into the air, we could then go ahead and uh, use a fluorescent light to see where the particles would, would deposit it and to see them in air. Um, I, I think later on, somebody else actually did some of those experiments. But uh, at the time, we decided not to go that way, but to use uh, sodium chloride uh, and ten percent sodium chloride in air, and that's because it's a it's a NIR standard that that's often done, and it's and it also too, if you're going to have people around, sodium chloride in air is probably the safest thing you can you can put into the air type system. So that was, was we looked at that. So, but it's still still a good consideration, especially if you want to test something out. You might want to go back. Somebody might want to go back and take a look at that. Yeah, yeah some of the challenges we found in, in the, the measuring, and we were hoping to get the visual effect. I know a number of other researchers had used a, a glycerin based um, to look at the plume um, or, or the dispersion, and, and that's great for visual. Um, but it, it didn't really match um, uh, kind of a, the, the human dispersion, you know, with, with the uh, particle size and so forth. The sodium chloride was a great estimator. Uh, and potassium chloride would have been perhaps better, but getting our hands on laboratory grade potassium chloride was more difficult. Um, really, in the end, uh, this is the apparatus we built, and and we have uh, two um, DC power uh, controls uh, run by an ARM processor in the middle. We had to write the software. You know, this is a a one week sprint to get the controls done, and those two controls drive the solenoids for the compressed air and also the nebulizer. And so we had to tune everything so the nebulizer would emit uh, the right amount of aerosol in the chamber. And once you um, uh, disperse it through opening the, the compressed air, uh, trying to make sure it matched again with, with human exhalation uh, flow and volume. And that's where that medical spirometer came to play where we inserted in line. And it turned out fairly good. I mean, qualitatively, we were trying to match the curves from prior work uh, you know, Dr. Lindsay um, at, at NIOSH and his team and a number of others um, out there have, have pu well published this over the last couple of decades. So we're trying to match those, um, again, with low cost test apparatus. And, and we, we succeeded in that. So that was fairly good. So I think one of the other outcomes of our quick sprint on this study was that uh, we started to understand how to measure the aerosols in a, um, a really turbulent environment. And so... Uh, we, we concocted a couple of uh, methods. Um, some represented, you know, different mathematical techniques that you all have probably utilized or considered. Um, again, we're trying to understand how to reduce this and measure that reduction because it's not a two-dimensional space or a single sensor. We actually had four sensors in this fume hood to, to measure that. And you can kind of see the dispersion um, over on the left and each of the colors uh, represent each of the sensors. And eventually they converge when all the aerosols mix in the air. You know, a number of the aerosol risk models that are out there is, can, uh, presumes well mixed. Well, if you think about a highly transmissible disease, you know, well mixed environment's fine, you know, after a minute or two in a, in a small chamber, but the reality is you might be exposed at a, at a high peak, you know, within the first uh, few seconds. And that's really um, keeping those two phases in mind is really what we're we're thinking about. If I could just so, say one, yeah, Andrew, go ahead, Richard. Uh, well, you did this. Um, I think we're already uh, luckily our minds are taking it out. You did this at the beginning of COVID, and if everybody thinks back how it was at that point, 
people were afraid to leave the house. Uh, people would stay at home. Um, and you went out and acquired all these materials, all this different equipment. And probably the most difficult times you can imagine and built this whole system. So when people think about it, say this, this was just not normal normal times you didn't have, you couldn't ride around for weeks on end picking out the right pieces of equipment but you did manage to get put together a, a wonderful test apparatus in a really short amount of time under extreme conditions so i think that was a i i applaud my co my co-worker for that nathan good job and by the way i'm appearing as nathan edwards too on this uh. oh okay i see you richard so the um the other thing you know going out and acquiring you know i i, I felt pretty comfortable at home wearing a um a P100 uh, dual cartridge respirator. I mean, from my hazmat and paramedic days, that was just normal practice. So that's that was my standard uh, gear that I wore out to the stores and shopping. Same with my colleague out here in Colorado that um, helped set up the laboratory environment. Um, so that, that was not a problem. But after we finished that, um, that was about six weeks sprint to uh, get up the, uh, stand up the test environment in about two weeks. Um, do the experiments on the dispersion through different fabrics, uh, also the microscope images, and, and then have our mathematician help with the data processing uh, to, to build out the analysis. Um, and, and then we wrote the draft paper and put it out on MedArchive, uh, the, the preprint server, which is great to get it out to the world um, fairly quickly. And that happened within six weeks. Well, our, our research leaders here at Myers said, hey, this is great. Glad you got it done. What else do you want to do? So again, Richard and I kind of talked through with our, our, our small team at the time. We only had four of us working it then. Like, well, what else does our country need? And, and you know, it, we really boiled down to our country has high dependency on public transportation. Um, and also in July, you know, everybody's starting to think about, well, what do we do for schools? And so, so many of the school system we're gonna start up in early August. So we, we pitched that to our research leaders say, hey, we gotta focus on buses. We wanna do both transit buses and school buses. Uh, and so, oh, here, here's the timeline of, of what we're um, are, are conducting the studies. So right now we're in July. So that's the month four period of time. Now, buses are a very, very different environment. Everything's moving. And if you talk with any chemist, they'll tell you that momentum is at effect on any kind of aerosol or particle, as, uh, including the air mass that it contains. And so um, we had to reach back to understand how to test and measure that as well. So we looked at some prior studies or concurrent studies. So this actually just north of us in Colorado Springs, um, RTD is the rapid transit uh, uh, out of Denver. And so they had an engineer working on airflow measurements in several of their buses. So they have the articulated bus in the middle, um, their transit bus, and also the commuter, which is your motor coach style. Um, and, and so they'd done a press release um, on this. And, and, <clears throat> and you kind of see that the airflow uh, through the bus, they, they measured with three anemometers, uh, windows open, closed, and you kind of read the report as well. Uh, and they have some pretty good data but it's just airflow. It doesn't actually tell us, what about the particles? Are you actually evacuating them effectively? How about the dead air spaces? You know, are things being trapped? Um, and how do we reduce that risk? So it's a good starting point. There's a couple of other approaches that we consider is, well, what if we were to smoke the bus, you know, really fill it up to its saturation point? And, and this study uh, was conducted out of Fresno State, um, uh, Dr. Talfik out there, who's part of the Transportation Institute, ran this, and and so there was they did some press releases on this. Again, they used the full saturation inside the bus and measured the time, uh, how long it took to reduce to a minuscule amount. Um, they also uh, um, induced some aerosols with uh, some of their test uh, uh, bio aerosols that are pretty safe. I think it's MS2 macrophage. If I have that right, I might have that wrong. Um, and so they were able to measure some bioaerosols as well in their studies. Uh, but again, we weren't going to stand up um, a capability and go through the uh, OSHA required elements to do bioaerosols. Um, so the sodium chloride and potassium chloride venues would be great. Again, doing a full saturation, that's not so realistic. Um, and if you're having a, a, the bus being driven, it's, it's not practical either. Um, some of the other things that we happened across is from 1998. Uh, this came out of the TCRP 
Transportation Research Board, which is part of the National Academy of Science, um, they looked at this leading edge suction. So in transit buses, as you have this low pressure on the flat front of the bus driving forward, it actually sucks particles and contaminants from the rear engine compartments all the way up into the driver compartment. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to think about that. And so we were sort of aware of this, but again, how do we quantify the reduction of contaminants um, that we were going to put in the air, you know, the, the sodium chloride? Uh, so this is all background information. The other uh, portion of background information that, that we sort of knew, but much of this is not well published, um, Department of Homeland Security partnered with New York City and their mass transit uh, MTA to do a number of bio threat scenarios. And this kind of started from post 9-11 um, and, and also some of the air quality challenges they have in the subways and contained environments. That's been well studied as well. So they had done a number of uh, experiments uh, partnering with MIT Lincoln Labs out of Massachusetts to do so. And they were getting ready to conduct a study as well. Um, so we knew this was going on. Again, our, our perspective is let's run as fast as we can and if anybody in the science community gets the data out to the, the global uh, public before we do, that's fine. That would be a, uh, a point where we just simply just stop and cease and desist our research because somebody else did it. Again, it was a race to get this out to uh, you all in the global community. Now, we, we never hit a barrier on this other than acquiring equipment, but it really required a whole of nation team. Let me describe that a little bit. So here at MITRE, you know, we expanded our team to include some folks who had backgrounds in robotics, um, uh, as well as industrial security specialists who helped uh, rapidly acquire the equipment, um, including our, our contracts we had to put in place for, for this aerosol equipment, um, and a number of others on our team. Now, so we had about seven uh, of us uh, doing the field work, but it, it, it couldn't be just us. We didn't have buses here at MITRE. That wasn't part of our mission area. So we had to strike partnerships with the local governments to do so. If we couldn't get a bus and a driver, uh, you know, our, our set of experiments wouldn't have, have happened. And so we're fortunately that uh, one of the school districts, Colorado Springs D11, answered the call. Um, and I will say, I, I called just about every school district in the region, seeing if they would partner, knowing that they weren't in session and that we could help answer their risk questions for aerosols, as well as that of the nation. So D11 was great um, through some personal contacts and relationships. Um, and I say it was great that on staff, they had a few chemical engineers. Again, this is one of the oldest school districts in the state. A lot of old buildings where they have to deal with formaldehyde and asbestos and, and those kinds of hazards that just exist in the old constructions. So um, the, <clears throat> the executive director for transportation and facilities, he also was an engineer. So he's a retired civil engineer from the Air Force. Uh, and again, great partners. So we had daily discussions throughout our experiments with them uh, to understand what was going on what kinds of experiments, what kinds of things were practical for the school district to implement to reduce the aerosol risks. The other partner was uh, Mountain Metro. Um, they run the transit organization here in Colorado Springs. Um, and, and while they didn't have uh, scientists on staff, they had motivated um, a management team to help answer this question, not only for them, but for others. The third partner I will say is the equipment vendor. So Particle Plus, um, after they understood what we were trying to do, um, they actually dedicated a whole production run to getting our equipment out in a matter of weeks. Um, so that was phenomenal. Now, Particle Plus happens to make uh, more clean room oriented sensors. And that's what we use, these handheld uh, particle counters that can go down to 0.3 microns in size up to 25. And they measure six uh, sequential channels um, together. So, we could not have conducted these experiments without everybody on board uh, moving towards this mission of trying to understand aerosol risk. So let's get into the science. I, I think this is probably what most of you are waiting for. So these are really the key questions. If we emit particles, um, you know, again, as a simulation of, of a sick person with COVID, how far do they go? How fast do they travel? What's the concentrations? How quick does it dissipate out? What are the peak effects? Um, and, and what are the strategies that can be um, imposed to reduce those? So a lot of questions to answer with this series of experiments. 
we did not know the answer to any of these. Sure, we had some good hypothesis, but again, the field experiments on bus in motion in a realistic environment, um, we couldn't find any uh, published data out there on that. Let's talk about the instrumentation quickly. Again, these are the particle counters. Um, they, they can measure temperature, humidity, six channels of measurement uh, sequentially. And we, we set the sampling rate to one second uh, sample. So that was um, for most clean room environments, uh, that's about as fast as you can go. And this is a scientific experiment. Uh, so, so one second sampling rates were uh, really handy to have. It could give you the differential mass and particle masses, but we wanted the raw particle counts. Um, <clears throat> and we could calculate the mass if we needed to. Uh, the sensors we placed um, on the floor of the aisle, on the ceiling, and also on each of the seats. So each measurement location row um, had four sensors located. Um, I'm showing you a picture here of the transit bus, uh, but we also did the same for the school bus. We also used the anemometers. So these are from Omega, and these are a hot wire type of anemometer. And so they'll measure airflow in a single direction. Now, during the school bus, we, we could only get our hands on one anemometer, and that was lent to us at the time. So we picked a central aisle location for that. By the time the uh, transit bus experiments, we had all 16. And the radio control, so we can collect uh, data, um, a mass amount of data per experiment. It was really handy to have. The other piece of equipment, which is really nice, uh, and I, I knew this as an electrical engineer, Inside of our iPhones, we have some phenomenal sensors for um, uh, measuring accelerometer that, you know, the bumps and, and so forth in the road, magnetometer for direction and, and well as um, high fidelity GPS. And so I, I picked an app and I can't remember which one I was using, but it was the best at the time. And I know that has changed. They would actually record the data. So we got the data downloads for uh, geolocation, altimeters and speedometer and, and so forth. Again, when we're trying to correlate um, the momentums of these aerosol clouds, we thought it would be pretty useful to have. So let's get into the school bus experiment. So this is the school bus that we use. Now it's pretty typical across the United States to have something that holds about 66 or 65 passengers. This one is a 2013 Bluebird. Um, it actually is a propane driven. It was a uh, acquired a number of years prior just on a on a, another uh, pilot program for experiments of how effective is propane driven bus. Now we have electric uh, experiments going on, electric batteries, but it was really nice to have the school district uh, partner with us to dedicate this bus to us for a whole week. Um, the last two days of, of working with the school district were on the road test. So we had three days on the ground static to understand how to do the experiment. And we tried all kinds of things really um, with this, uh, you know, understanding what the effects of windows open and close, the roof hatches that you could open. Uh, but these buses do not have an HVAC system. They don't have air conditioning. Now, some in our, in our country do. You go down to the Southern Beltway in Phoenix and, and down in the South, uh, Eastern part of the United States, they, they tend to have air conditioning units, which could help um, with some of the aerosols, but these did not. So a lot of things to consider. At best, we had dashboard fans <laughs> um, to blow some air around and also the windows. We had to be pretty creative on this. And, and the other thing here in Colorado is, as well as some of the states, we, we have snow and sometimes it can be sub-zero temperatures. Not, not all days, you know, at 6,500 foot elevation, you know, the sun is pretty radiant. So it melts things, keeps things warm, but on occasion we have cold weather. And when the bus is driving at 25 to 40 miles an hour, um, there is a concern of wind chill as well. So we had to think about that. Um, you can see down in the lower right corner, uh, you know, all of these sensors, uh, the particle counters were networked over ethernet. And, and so you can imagine a lot of cable that we had to string throughout the bus. It's a lot of work to set up an experiment, especially when you're uncertain of the data, what it looks like, what kinds of configurations you can do in your on the road test. And, and those first three days were critical. We tried all kinds of things. We um, even to emulate the roof hatch open, we, we bought this inline uh, fan, 400 cubic feet in a minute, 
and a six inch duct work. And we, we pipe that up to the roof patch as, as kind of a blow by estimator um, of driving on the road to see if, if that was even gonna have any effect on the air cells in the bus. And it turned out it, it was a good estimator. It wasn't exact. Uh, we weren't within one standard deviation of the real driving on road, but did it tell us that uh, roof hatches might be an important part of our experiment series? And, and the answer was yes. Um, one of the other challenges in setting up with the school bus without having air conditioning, it was hot. Um, you know, at the end of uh, beginning of August, you know, uh, we were sometimes in the morning at 75% relative humidity, and in the afternoons, 105 degrees Fahrenheit inside the bus, especially when we did all windows closed and the vinyl seats. It, it, for that 10 minute period of time for each experiment, it got really hot. So we were ecstatic to clear the bus out with our fans afterwards and open the windows um, to do more on the road tests uh, for that. So ultimately in the end with the school bus, we came back with a number of insights on, on that. We um, used a custom software. We had to write SCADA software for these sensors to monitor what's going on in real time. And, and so the snapshot is showing you the particle graphs of that. It's really interesting to watch the particle graphs happen. So the thin spike that you see on the left and the right, um, a passenger, that thin spike is, a, is the aerosol cloud moving quickly past our sensors. Over on the far right, you will see where the aerosol cloud starts elevating the cumulative buildup. Um, and so the baseline goes up. And that's, that's the second phase of the aerosol cloud as it um, it builds throughout the bus and, and getting to a well-mixed environment. So this is part of the observations of running field experiment. We're not sure what it looks like. So we wanted all of our monitors available uh, to understand that. And throughout the early part of the week, this is part of our own team calibration before we can reduce the set of experiments to run on the road uh, for the Thursday and Friday of that week. We saw a lot of things there. Um, a lot of noise uh, for the 300 nanometer particles, which is expected. And really the goal was trying to understand how to interpret it. I will say just a fun story about the school bus experiment. So we, we had actually a high school intern who had worked for me for the last three years. Um, this was his very last week as an intern. He was riding a yellow school bus with me doing field experiments, but he wrote the software for the SCADA controls. And one of the challenges was, you know, un unsure in how much a 10 minute experiment, how much data we'd actually get. So the 28 particle counters in the bus, um, I think the early part of the week, we had a 10 minute experiment, and then it would take a half an hour to pull down that data to archive it on the computer. So, you know, that limited the number of experiments you'd actually run during a day. Turns out that um, we have to optimize that software so it would be multi-threaded in a very, very different way so that we could collect the data faster at the end of the experiment. So they were, uh, um, one of our, our principal engineers who, who had computer engineering background was helping our high school intern rewrite the software while we're driving to do air, um, airflow checks with the anemometer. So they're writing the software as we go on the bus to modify it. Ultimately, in the end, we got it down to about a 10 or 12 minute data collection um, you know, after each experiment. And that was reasonable. So it'd be uh, about 30 minutes overall. And which means we can run more experiments at the end of the week. Again, these particle graphs, you, you know, it, it, there's a lot of empirical science um, without getting into the quantitative measurement of this, just to understand the physics, uh, what's good ventilation, bad ventilation. So the good ventilation, you tend to see a very narrow aerosol cloud peak and it dissipates out and the baseline, it goes back to almost your starting point. And that was really important to understand. All right. So let me move on to the transit bus. Um, again, with the school bus, I will say you can read the paper, you can understand the results, because I want to get to the transit bus and then ultimately in the end, have offer you guys some conclusions and observations from all this uh, series of experiments. So here we are in, in month uh, six, 
uh, September, we had a, a one month delay from school buses to the transit. And that was okay, it gave us time to regroup, improve some of our tests and measurement uh, and operation. And so what we were testing was the 35 foot low floor model. Again, you'll see this all over many different cities. Um, the low floor meaning the front part of the bus is, is uh, handicap accessible. The back part, you have to go up two steps and sit down. And the HVAC and the engine compartment tends to be in the back of the bus. They also have roof hatches, but due to employee safety and health, most of the roof hatches are not opened uh, while driving because you have to be on a ladder, which means the drivers have to go through ladder training. And so it's a little bit more complex with that. So we knew that was not gonna be a primary option for these transit organizations um, for improving ventilation. The rear hatch you could open by standing on the floor, but the front one uh, not. The HVAC system had a 2200 uh, cubic feet a minute uh, fan and um, the filters in the back, really the manufacturer specified only these, I think MERV 7 at best. And, and many of you know, MERV 7 doesn't really filter much other than a, a large accumulation of dust and, and not really that very well. So we, we wanted to uh, understand the effect of applying a MERV 13 air filter um, as part of our experiments. The one challenge, of course, we knew the manufacturers is you have a pressure drop across those filters. Is it enough pressure drop that it's gonna cause a motor problem on those blowers? So we wanna measure that as well. One thing that we didn't know is with the transit bus, it was not as uniform of an environment as a school bus. Uh, the school bus actually we observed that uh, some of the aerosols would be baffled by the seats. Most of the seats on a school bus are high back and they do that for a child's safety in case they need to stop quickly or um, in, in the event of a collision, those high back uh, seats are padded and will prevent the, the kids from uh, sliding forward. Well, it also prevented the aerosol movement somewhat in the bus, but this low floor model, not so. Uh, we had in mind to use the computation fluid dynamic simulation to help us with the experiments. The challenge of uh, CFD, if you've uh, performed it before, is how do you validate your model? Well, you need empirical data to help validate that. So uh, we knew that would be uh, perhaps a month or two or three down the road after collecting data. So what we used CFD for was to understand these streamlines and understand the turbulent environment and where maybe we should place our sensors. So if you look at the graph on the right side, you'll see there's two small vortices and, and, and those vortices, we were concerned that it might be a little bit of a dead air space. So we decided to put our sensors, not just midline of the seat areas, but a little bit towards the middle aisle of the bus because we wanted to capture those aerosols. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So our use of CFD, um, knowing that all models are wrong, some are useful, we wanted to make it useful for placement of sensors. And then maybe eventually we get to a validated uh, model. You can see the inside of the bus um, in where we position things. The um, mask study uh, where we put the, um, the mannequin uh, in front, that was not for a driving position. This is more how far do the particles go when you emit them. And, but in, during driving position, that was what you see here in the middle picture, uh, mannequin facing sideways. Um, you can imagine some passenger who's talking sideways. Uh, so it's not gonna be a full front uh, facing dispersion event or a back facing dispersion event. So we kind of see things maybe bouncing off the windows or doors and dispersing from there. Um, my, my friend and colleague though, had a great suggestion as we learned from our school bus. Um, and, and Richard had told me, he said, you know, how do, how do you know what's happening with this turbulent environment and the airflow? So Richard, I don't know if you want to tell a little bit of, of these, um, uh, telltales that we placed? <clears throat> well, um, I guess I'm a sailor and sailboat racing my entire life. And we put telltales on the sails because we have to watch how the wind travels around the sails and when it backfills and small differences in the sail, top, middle and bottom can make the difference between winning and losing. So we always instrument our sails with, uh, with these telltales. And, uh, there's a, there's a great movie out right now. It's, um, it's been out, it's called, uh, Ferrari versus Ford. And in that movie, there's a, there's a scene of there about aerosol engineering 
where the engineers put telltales on the hood of the car and they could watch the wind blow over the car and redesign the hood of the car so that it would not lift off the ground. So that would be a great homework assignment for anybody who wants to see that movie. So we, we went ahead and instrumented this and it, it gave Nathan a chance to actually get a very rough look at what the airflow was like in there before he set up his sensor. So, and, and it, it looks pretty cool, I think. Yeah. Nathan? Well, and, and even during driving, um, we video recorded every single experiment run just so we can understand from looking at the raw particle data and the anemometer data, um, if we can correlate that to what we were physically seeing with these telltales, uh, which we used uh, half inch width surveyors tape um, it all over the bus and uh, near the HVAC ductwork, the roof hatches, the windows, the aisles, just about anywhere we could put it. So one, one, other, am I on the, one other thing that um, uh, there was a, when I was in college, sophomore physics, we would always get these challenge problems. And one of the challenge problems was you fill a balloon with helium in, a, in an automobile, a birthday balloon, and you suspend it between the front and the back seats, drive down the road at 50 miles an hour and step on the brakes. Does the balloon go forward? Does the balloon go back or stay the same? And you, you, would, you would think that the balloon would go forward because you stepped on the brakes, but no, the balloon goes backwards because the air inside that chamber is heavier than than the inside the balloon and i think that always gave me the, uh, the the point that you really have to think twice about aerosol so if this bus is traveling 50 miles an hour down the road all those particles are also going 50 miles an hour down the road maybe plus minus you know two two miles per hour so when that bus driver steps on that bus all those particles would naturally go to the front and because they're they're not slowing down until they're the front. So you could actually watch the you could actually watch not just normal driving, but what happens when you step on the gas and step on the brake. Picking picking the seats to sit on might might you might want to say, I don't want to sit in the front and the back. And then that, that gave maybe gave Nathan some ideas about how to set up the census. And I'll let Nathan take it back. Yeah. So so actually um I'm I'm excited to show some of the graphs of that, you know, these empirical observations of the data in real time with the telltales. Um, and watching the particle data, it was really insightful. I mean, in the end, we had a lot of um, data collected for this, about 80 miles driven on the transit bus uh, through normal bus routes, including bus stops, doors open and closing, running the HVAC system. And, and really, you know, as you'll probably find that when you're trying to rapidly analyze a mass amount of data, generating the plots is very, very useful. So graphical analysis, just to understand how to do the mathematics and the statistics. Um, but let me show some of these uh, plots uh, with you. So one of the first set of plots is on masks. Um, and this is from the front position of the bus. And so if no mask was worn uh, by, by our test apparatus, and this we were just using a three layer cotton mask, just you know, uh, for rough estimation, you can kind of see on the left side that the, the width of that first pulse, that's the initial dispersion, is fairly wide. And um, don't pay attention to the peak particle concentration. Actually, we saw peak particles up in the 20,000s, um, but, but just the, the waveform shape itself. So the, the width is wide. And then fairly quickly, within 200 seconds, you start seeing the cumulative buildup in the bus um, uh, 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 from wearing no mask. Conversely, using a mask over on the right side, that peak waveform is pretty narrow. And, and then you see very quickly thereafter, it dissipates and the residual amount of aerosols in the air goes significantly down. You know, so, so from a graphical standpoint, wearing a mask for source control is a very good idea on these buses. And you know, this, we could see this kind of data throughout from the front location, um, <clears throat> which was uh, five meters in front of the dispersion uh, uh, place, all the way through the back of the bus, which I think was 7.8 meters um, as well. So wearing a mask, great idea for source control. So if you're feeling sick, wear a mask. But here's some other particle graphs, actually, that makes it really interesting. So when all the windows and doors are closed, just as Richard was talking about, um, you know, the, the particles are moving with the, the mass amount of air. And we see that um, on the left side, you'll see that initial peak. And then there's a little bit of waffling 
it kind of goes down, then kind of goes up and then starts settling down. So that down and up is part of that momentum um, that we notice on the bus. And then it starts settling down when you get to that well-mixed environment. And, and what you notice though, is with all the doors and windows closed and the HVAC system is not running, that the residual amount of particles in a well-mixed environment is significantly higher than your baseline. So we're talking a, a count per sensor, uh, uh, 400 particles more than the baseline. And that's huge. And, and it still is pretty steady. We did not go past 10 minutes. I mean, we could have, but that would have not helped us answer the immediate effects of, of strategies for reducing the aerosols. Um, the other graph that I'll show you, again, interesting observations in real time. We see at the bus stops, um, and this didn't happen all the time, but when you open that rear passenger door, and that's usually what's used for passengers getting off, they get on the front, get off in the rear, we saw this step function decrease. So for this experiment, opening both doors at the stops helped reduce the aerosols. Now, it didn't happen all the time because sometimes you get a cross breeze outside of the bus stop that would just um, blow your particles around inside the bus. You really didn't get a, a, a flow uh, to reduce what was inside. But in general, that helps us understand a good strategy of, of making sure that both doors are open at the stops. Some of the other interesting observations, um, again, I, I already spoke that the, the particles stay aloft uh, for a long period of time uh, after a well-mixed environment. Uh, some of the other things in the middle graph, you see all these down arrows, the red arrows pointing down. You know, this is, um, the waffling inside the bus. Actually, we're watching the particles go back and forth. And, and you're looking for these new spikes up and down. And, and it's, it's just fascinating. So you can watch this on one sensor. This is row five. So that's slightly behind our dispersion location. And we watch the timing in our software um, between the, the sensor rows in front of that location and behind. And you could track its momentum with this aerosol cloud. Now, we didn't do the quantitative analysis to tell you uh, the, the details of how quickly it moves, what the, the mass of momentum is, um, but, but really to understand what happens with these clouds in a transit environment, high beat turbulent, and, and the effect of, of momentum uh, was, was important to note. Some of the other data that we looked at was using our, our 16 anemometers throughout the bus. Uh, so the graph on the left side, we closed the bus and we ran um, the HVAC system alone. And we also inserted those MERV 13 air filters in the back system. And what you notice is that it's pretty linear effect with the airflow in all the passenger seats uh, compared to what's right at the rear register of the HVAC system. So that HVAC at 2,200 cubic feet a minute essentially creates a, a, a flow system from front to back. And so eventually it would capture all the particles. Now, when we did not have the MERV 13 filter in place, the airflow would, would be what you see here, but the particles would get to a well-mixed environment much, much faster. So it really emphasized the importance of having good filters in the back to trap those particles to reduce the, the risk. The, the graph on the right side is without the HVAC system. And so we're monitoring the airflow at all, with all the windows open, the roof hatches open and so forth. And it's, you know, on the X axis, that's the bus speed. Um, how fast are we traveling on the road throughout the city? Again, it looks sort of linear, um, uh, you know, so the airflow almost correlated linearly. And, and so the the fit lines are in the black dash, which you can't see very well. But um, And so that was also insightful with this kind of bus. The school bus, we did not have a linear effect, um, which was really interesting to see. It was linear in the upper air of the school bus, but down near the seat in the central aisle, it was not. And again, that helps us observe the baffling of, of those school seats and, and their effect on airflow, as well as the aerosols. So in the end, we collected a lot of data. Um, again, you can see in our, our published paper, uh, you can read more about that. You can also go to the press release 
um, that MITRE uh, sent out. I think that was December of 2020. We have a link to our YouTube channel, which shows a four minute video or a short video clip of, of our transit experiments. So you can kind of see what happens. But I will tell you, you know, when you are trying to understand with science how to help the public, um, you can't just stop with a cool science experiment. You have to get it out to a digestible format. And so we had discussions with the school district as well as the transit organization about what kind of data would help them. And so they don't necessarily want to look at standard deviations or um, you know, areas under curves and so forth. They want a percentile in reduction. So ultimately, that's what we published uh, so that more audience could read this science report and understand what they could do to help improve their situations. But it's, it's difficult. So, you know, fast forward a year after our experiments, you know, all schools were now starting to open up in 2021, but the problem hadn't gone away. And, you know, the, the fortunate thing between our experiments and the fall semester 2021 is there have been a few more bus studies out there. And, and so the other challenge, as I'm sure you guys were all aware is we had a lot of politics in the way of good science, politics in the way of public health. And that was pretty ch uh, challenging. Uh, everything from wearing masks became political, where you know, the medical industry had been wearing masks for over 100 years to prevent uh, uh, infectious transmission. Um, and that was a bit challenge. The other thing is that many school systems still could not make sense of what was good data um, and good uh, techniques versus bad information or misinformation. So we, we tried to write a report, uh, a short paper, a three-pager, um, and get that out to the public. So um, Dr. Russell, she is a physician at, at uh, Johns Hopkins there in Maryland, and she also leads our healthcare research. So we wrote a paper on this, mostly referencing our studies and a number of others that have come out about uh, transmission and the effectiveness of wearing masks on school bus, because there had been a few now that had said, um, you know, through uh, thousands of students have not had any transmission uh, correlated to the buses and transportation. And that was pretty powerful. So we had to get the message out. And that's always a challenge with any of your information. Now, those of you who are strictly in the academic environment, I think, you know, the, the pure science is really important, but also make sure you you have some discussion that a broad audience could use as well. One of the other misnomers, and this is a follow-on, we, we did some indoor uh, uh, classroom tests as well as in, in certain environments, you know, and, and there's been um, some work done with carbon dioxide uh, using as an estimator. And it's a good estimator for human respiration and also kind of tells us uh, the air exchange rates but it doesn't necessarily follow the particles and their movement. So just keep that in mind. Of course, many of you probably know this already, but they're not correlated. And, and so we have to think about this aerosol infectious disease risk problem as, as twofold. So the final remarks really is when you're moving fast, there's a lot of things you have to think about. Always having some contingency plan in mind. We weren't sure if we were gonna get equipment, test equipment in time. Um, using simulation, to the best you can, but it's not the only thing that will help you. Sometimes there's a disassociation between your simulation results and the empirical studies. And really watching for the phenomena is, is important in your observations as you're trying to discover the science around that. So very important um, on the real-time monitoring and, um, and planning for contingencies and, and really get out there and do the science. Um, I can't encourage you enough to do that. Uh, don't stop with the simulation. So I will finish with that. I appreciate your time listening and um, uh, hopefully I have some questions. And I know if we run out of time for questions, uh, my contact information, Richard's contact information is here as well as on the paper. Thank you so much. Um, it was a really interesting talk. Are there any, we have time for a couple questions. Um, if people have questions, they can either put them in the chat and I can read them out. Um, oh, we have a question just now. Um, question from um, Kalyan Kodapali. Well, mixed was used to describe the condition in buses. How would you experimentally define that? Airflow? So what well mixed, um, 
what we cataloged in our in our uh, analysis is when at the point where the particles uh, did not have a a waveform that was distinguishable, it became more level. And and so some of the waveforms I've shown you earlier, you see that peak effect, and then it dissipates out to something that's a little more flat. And so that's that's the well mixed environment. Thank you. Our next question is um, from Hee Jung Jung. Have you observed the effect of the leading edge suction effect? Did you quantify air exchange rate for various conditions? Yeah, so, so yes, we observed the leading edge suction. So actually you would see from a dispersion event in the middle of the bus facing the back door, the within a number of seconds, the aerosol cloud would travel up towards the driver area. And that was that leading edge suction effect. It kind of was, it was very remarkable to notice that. Um, so that was very real. In terms of air exchange rate. So when you think about ACH, the air exchange and reducing risk, you know, that also in itself is an estimator. It doesn't tell you exactly when or how the particles are gonna be reduced. Um, so just keep that in mind. So we. We played with the air exchange rates and we could do that uh, through the volume calculation and the airflow rates, but we opted to focus our time more on the particle movement and the aerosol clouds rather than just the air exchange rate. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Is there an aerosol range that is most infectious equals effective in SARS-CoV-2 transmission? That's a difficult question. So let me describe that. Um, there are a number of, of sciences um, you know, in, in academia. Um, and on, on my panel at the National Academies in, in June, so Dr. Lindsay at NIOSH, um, Dr. Milton from UMD, I think these are two world leading experts on, on some of the infectious disease. There's a lot of equations that goes into that. So you have an emissions, what's the amount of virons emitted from a sick person. And you, um, and you can count that. There's not as many studies that actually capture and count that from the viral shedding standpoint. It get, gets into the aerosols, get into the air. There's a decline on the number of effective virons and on their effect, um, if infectiousness. So the UV radiation from the sun um, or the humidity affects their ability to infect. Ultimately in the end, somebody has to breathe it in. And it's not just breathing in, you have to get it to your upper respiratory for the Omicron variants or your lower respiratory for the prior variants. And there's a certain amount that they can look at from the, the titer, the TCID 50 um, uh, amounts of what it takes to infect an individual cell. We don't have all the science figured out for the infectiousness considering um, that. Uh, from an epidemiologic standpoint, they use an R value which is more of a societal population. You know, if one person, how many infected people uh, spawns out of that? Again, how you put this all together, there are some challenges that we, we don't have human studies to fully understand uh, a loading dose and, and what it takes. Now, the UK was conducting a study with the, I think the Delta variant, not the Omicron, um, a live human study. And that's an important part, it's very risky um, to do that and a lot of work, paperwork and OSHA to, to do so. But again, there's gaps in science and we don't really know how much of an aerosol dose it's gonna take to infect somebody. So we use an estimator and say, if it's a higher concentration amount, your risk is higher. So Nathan, I have a question because you sat on the bus all the time. If you were going to redesign a bus for the future to make it safer, what would you do inside the bus? Put baffles in it, put plastic shielding up, just, just off the cuff. Well, 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 how might you design the bus of the future? Well, that's a great question, Richard. And, and some of our colleagues we've in, uh, interact with uh, after this study with the uh, National Academies and Transportation uh, Research Board, they're actually looking at that right now. And so what I would do um, and, and we had actually hoped to have time to experiment with this is create a vertical laminar flow system where you have the HVAC blowing down from the overhead ducts, and then you have the return air down to the floor. This is what commercial aircraft have, by the way. And you look at the study conducted by the Department of Defense on commercial aircraft um, in 2020, it has a significant reduction in the amount of particles and the exposure of where it goes. So laminar flow system and bus, I think it'd be great 
um, getting a cost-effective solution, I am unsure about that for the bus manufacturers. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our hour. So if you have any additional questions, I um, ask you to um, direct them to our authors via email. Once again, if we could give one final round of applause and thank you so much for this interesting and engaging lecture and ensuing discussion. Thank you everybody for all of your time.